I'm sorry that the hall's just a bit dark, isn't it? Um, I hope you will all see enough if you want to take a note or two. Um, but equally, I hope the darkness doesn't make you go to sleep. Uh, I think it's great of you to be here, and I think it's going to be a great cause we make in coming to these monthly sessions of the Risha Ankogaron. I also think uh, that it's a great cause we make as uh, le senior leaders, really, of NSUK to get together like this and do a great bongyo like you've all just done. And uh, all these must be uh, great causes for the future. So I thank you very much. Uh, as you know, on summer course, we studied both part of the beginning and part of the end of the Risha Ankokaran. And the reason we did this was that those particular passages at the beginning of the end really summarized all that the Risha Ankokaran contains, but of course only in uh, the form of a summary. So as you remember, uh, we first of all, in the first lecture, considered the meaning of the title of the Risha Ankokaran, and we considered the first question and the first answer. That was the first lecture that you had on some course. Uh, for those of you who want to check this, um, when you're beginning to study the Risha Ankokoran in more depth, uh, that first lecture, the passages ended where we start today. That is to say, in volume two, at the top of page six. So if you haven't got the book with you, you better make a note of it. That was where we reached. I cannot suppress my fears. Top of page 6, volume 2. So that completed the first lecture. The second lecture, so far as the major writings was concerned, was actually uh, question 9 and answer 9, or most of answer 9. And if you want to refer to that later, that is at the bottom, it starts at the bottom of page 41, with the words, the host exclaimed with delight and uh, went on to the end of the first paragraph on page 44. <coughs> page 44. So that is what we've done so far. And uh, I should add again, in case it wasn't clear, that those lectures given on summer course which were also the same lectures given on the European summer course, uh, are based on the lectures which President Igeda gave on the Risha Ankokoran uh, some long time ago now, in the 1960s. So, uh, I think it was clear to everybody through those two lectures what the meaning, the true meaning of Risha is, establishing the ultimate truth. Uh, and what the deep meaning of ankoku is, securing peace in the land. And I don't intend to go back in the least over those lectures again, but they will be published in full in the October issue of the UK Express, which comes out very shortly. So uh, this will be a useful way of refreshing your memories. And also I would ask you, in your chapters and headquarters, to really ask every member to study those two lectures, particularly those people who weren't able to go on summer course for one reason or another, because they then uh, can catch up, as it were, with what everyone else learnt from it. So really, today's lecture we'll call number three, continuing on, uh, sorry, number two, isn't it? Lecture number two, sorry. Uh, and it's based on a very, very short question two, which is page six in your books, in which uh, the process of shakabuku is taken a, another step forward by Nichiren Baishonin. Of course, as you remember, uh, he is the traveler, uh, he is the host, and he's talking to the regent of Japan, Hojo Tokiori, the most powerful man in Japan, who uh, was disguised, as it were, in this Gosho, 
uh, as the traveller. So, at this stage of Shakaboku, of course, it's only at a very mild level. Uh, therefore, today, today's lecture too, in a sense, is at quite a mild level. But as the process of Shakaboku goes on, uh, things begin to get quite heated. In fact, by the time you reach question three, uh, the traveller is already, as it's put, flushed with anger uh, and getting really worked up and upset about what Nichiren Daishon is saying. So I'm sure all of us in Shakabuka, at one point or another, have caused people to be flushed with anger. Uh, and Nichiren Daishonin's description of this process is very accurate indeed in a lot of cases. So this particular question today uh, is where we begin to edge towards getting down to brass tacks, if you like. That is to say, uh, the traveller says, all right, you've been talking about the three calamities and seven disasters, and you've been talking about the Buddhist gods departing from the land. You know, what, what right? He says it very politely at this stage to Nishan Vaishnavi. You know, what right have you got? What proof have you got for making such astonishing statements? So I'll ask John now just to read the question. The guest said, these disasters that before the empire, these calamities of the nation, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. Now I have been privileged to enter your home and to listen to these enlightening words of yours. You speak of the gods and sages taking leave of, and you speak of the gods and sages taking leave and of dark disasters and calamities arising side by side. Upon what sutras do you base your views? Could you describe for me the passages of proof? So it's so short, shall we ask John to read it once again? The guest said, These disasters that befall the empire, these calamities of the nation, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. Now, I have been privileged to enter your home and to listen to these enlightening words of yours. You speak of the gods and sages taking leave and of disasters and calamities arising side by side. Upon what sutras do you base your views? Could you describe for me the passages of proof? So as you see, it's all very mild and uh, almost gentle and uh, courteous. And I think Nichiren Daishonin is being really very kind to the traveller since we know the traveller is Hojo Tokuyori because uh, he is really putting in that traveller's mouth words which sound quite merciful and compassionate. The most important sentence there is, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. So really he's crediting Hojo Tokiori with this deep concern for the sufferings of the ordinary people of Japan. Though, sadly, we know historically that Hojo Tokiori uh, took no notice of the Rishu Ankokuron whatsoever. So, uh, Nishin Daishonin is gradually developing his shakabuku, as I said. And when Hojo Tokiori, or the traveller, gets really angry, of course, it's the shock of being told that everything he's believed in up to now is totally wrong. And that Japan has allowed Buddhism to become distorted, uh, and filled with false teachings. And remember, the traveller is a Nembutsu believer. And uh, Nichiren Daishonin uh, explains, of course, that slander is the sole cause of the three calamities and seven disasters. So nobody likes to have their ignorance or stupidity pointed out to them. And it's very natural that as the story goes on, his, the traveller's anger arises. But we have to do this. I feel this is the, this is the lesson from this Gosha, or one of the lessons from this Gosha. We have to be prepared to cause people sometimes a bit of upset, a bit of anger. Even using uh, shoju rather than shakabuku, still the debate and discussion may get very heated. 
So this can't be helped if we're really going to open the eyes of the people of the world or the people of this country to these teachings. Inevitably we'll encounter such difficulties. And needless to say, that is why Sensei said that uh, short guidance, which I have repeated over and over and over again over the last few years since he said it, that we should talk to our friends and acquaintances about Buddhism, whether or not they listen to what we say. Whether or not, in other words, they turn their back on us. So, this, this is, isn't it, both in Nichiren Daishonin's case and in our case, should we do Shakabuku in that firm way, this is really jihi, in every sense of the word. That, we're, that we manage to muster up the courage because of our concern for the sufferings of other people to talk to them about Buddhism, encourage them to practice even though, you know, we may have uh, a few insults uh, or derisive laughter directed back at us. But this is really jihi, isn't it? And this is why Sensei said that we should talk no matter whether people listen to what we say or not. So if you compare the traveller and the way Nichiren Daishonin puts those words into his mouth, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. I very much doubt, sadly, if you look at the leaders and the statesmen of the countries of the world, perhaps particularly uh, we, we should be concerned with the leaders and statesmen of our own country, whether they are really so profoundly concerned by the sufferings of the ordinary people. It's probably doubtful, isn't it? There are so many sufferings in this country and elsewhere. We've just had the riots in Birmingham, which left a trail of suffering behind it, and arose, no doubt, out of suffering. The same way we've just had the disaster of Mexico City, and also we have continuing unemployment in this country. We have one in three, I think it is now, divorces with all the unhappiness this often brings with it. The problem of Northern Ireland. <coughs> the problems outside of our own sphere of Lebanon and of Iran and Iraq and so on. The list is absolutely endless. But whether the statesmen really do feel the sufferings of the ordinary people is extremely doubtful because I don't think with the best will in the world they've got the time to. Most statesmen today, I believe firmly, are rushing from one point to the next stopping up gaps, filling in holes, leaning against something that looks as if it's going to collapse unless they lean against it, rushing from crisis to crisis. This is the life, isn't it, of a statesman or a politician these days. So even those who may be merciful people simply haven't got the time to really feel the sufferings of the people. And in the end, of course, this process of crisis after crisis sort of mesmerizes them. They wake up, you know, what's the crisis today? <coughs> sure enough, one appears and they're rushing off in another direction. So they become mesmerized by it. They become immune from reality as a result of that. So they patch up all the time as Mr. Izumi, in that famous guidance he gave, I think it was here when he came in the early 1970s, when he said you can't cure a baby's diarrhea by slapping a plaster over its bottom. <laughs> but this is what the politicians and the statesmen, because they have no other alternative, this is what most of the time they're doing, slapping plaster on the bottom. So, Mr. Toda said, the aim of politics should be that everyone should enjoy life to the full. 
in circumstances of their own choice. It's a beautiful statement and in a few words sums up what should be the aim of politics. The aim of politics should be that everyone should enjoy life to the full <coughs> in circumstances of their own choice. So this is the same, isn't it, as the fifth prayer that we recite every day in Gongyo. Lastly, I pray for the Gohonzon Gohonzon's impartial benefits to spread throughout the world and bring peace and happiness to all mankind and the entire universe. Uh, in the past, uh, politicians, particularly in the past maybe, so far as Europe is concerned, sacrificed people quite willingly for the sake of going to war. And we all know the appalling casualties, particularly in World War I and World War II. Perhaps they're still prepared to do that. Perhaps, I say. But I believe now it's not a case of planning wars or planning uh, so far ahead as to even envisage such a thing. Defending oneself from it, yes but not, in a sense, planning aggressive wars. Certainly not, I believe, in this country. And the reason for that is that there is no time to think about it either. Because the natural disasters that are occurring, both in this country and all over the world, are escalating at such a pace that, again, the politicians are fully busy in rushing from one point to another, mending those cracks and holes. In other words, the situation in the world and is getting out of control. This is the truth of life, I believe, as it is at the moment. We're fortunate in this country still. Still things are sort of under control, but they are very nearly getting out of control. The minor strike very nearly got out of control. Football hooliganism very nearly got out of control. And perhaps we still have to wait to see whether or not it'll finally get totally out of control. But certainly we could say the incident overseas uh, <coughs> against the Italians was out of control totally. So these calamities and disasters that are besetting the world are becoming so frequent and becoming so close to one's own front door that the situation for the politician and statesman is more difficult and more trying than it's ever been before. So what does this all mean? As I said during summer course, I'm astounded at the difference in the last five years since we did the series of Richard Hancock and Ron lectures before. It's unbelievable. And there can be no doubt, and I'm sure you all agree, that when we attended those lectures, they were sort of theory. Yes, there were all sorts of troubles in other parts of the world, but somehow this country itself wasn't yet so obviously on the slippery slope. But now it definitely is. It can't be denied. So this means, doesn't it, that it truly is the time. We said this often on summer course. Now is the time. Now is the age of conflict. The age of Mapo. And the time when the great law of nam myoho renge -kyo must appear. So, of course, because of this situation, the people are yearning, they must be, mustn't they, yearning more and more in their hearts to find the Buddha. Though, of course, they don't put it into those words consciously. They are longing for a solution. They are longing to know how to live without fear. How to live with hope for the future. And this more and more is coming clear to us, isn't it? That, that the message we must put across 
<coughs> at every possible opportunity, whether it's in an introductory lecture, whether it's at a discussion meeting, wherever is the concrete hope and determination for the future which we have as a result of understanding or beginning to understand the incredible power of the gods. So, as senior leaders, this is the message which should be passed everywhere now. I don't mean through blaring trumpets, but I mean this is the message people are waiting to hear. Therefore, if, even if they can't believe anything you say to begin with, the very fact that you express hope for the future and determination for the future is going to have a profound effect on other people's lives. So I really feel, you know, at this particular point in time, really make sure that everyone understands this and that this is the message they determine to pass, whether at a group meeting or a discussion meeting or whatever. Always hope, 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 and determination and conviction in the future. And this is what will strike people's hearts, even though they may object on the surface to begin with to what we're saying. So Buddhism says there is always a time. It's amazing when you think about it, that all that is happening now, all but was predicted for this age of Mapo is part of a rhythm. Part of a rhythm that flows through past to present to future and which the Buddhas understood. This is why to us brought up now on Nichiren Daishonin's teachings there should be nothing surprising in what is happening. I remember a few years ago, since they're saying that the 1980s would be a really difficult period. And if I remember rightly, he said that as the 1980s go on, it'll get more and more difficult. Certainly through till towards the end of the 1980s. But of course that will vary from country to country, from one part of the world from the other. We're not finished yet with seeing the escalation of the three calamities and seven disasters in this country or in other parts of the world. That's for sure. But on the other hand, for us, it's yet more and more emphasis, isn't it, that it's the time. It's what we are living for. It's why we are bodhisattvas of the earth are appearing out of the ground, isn't it? Because it's the time in the rhythm of life or in the rhythm of the development and growth and cycle of life of this planet. So Nichiren Daishonin appeared, didn't he, out of the incredible calamities and disasters of 13th century Japan. In the midst of it all, Nichiren Daishonin appeared and established the true law, achieved Risho. The Soka Gakkai, though it was founded in the 1930s in a small way, but it actually appeared in society out of the destruction of World War II. The atomic bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and the destruction of virtually every city in Japan raised to the ground through conventional bombing. Out of this, the Soka Gakkai appeared. And now, as the world situation deteriorates more and more, as the nuclear threat hangs over us, as the destruction of the environment becomes more and more clear and apparent to us, so SGI is appearing. And together with SGI, NSUK. There's nothing that's by chance, is it? It's all part of a rhythm of life, a natural evolution. And this is why Nishin Daishonin, of course, could say with such conviction that Kosunufu will occur as sure as an arrow aimed at the earth cannot miss its target.
because he understands the rhythm of life and the rhythm and cycle of life of this planet. In the 17th chapter of the Lotus Sutra, it was, it was said, the good medicine is left for those of the evil-filled latter day of the law. 3,000 years ago or so, and Gentile said, in the fifth 500 years, the mystic law shall spread and benefit mankind far into the future. And in the Lotus Sutra, chapter 17, in the fifth 500 years after my death, accomplish worldwide coast and roof or never allow its flow to cease. Chakamuni didn't say, in the fifth 500 years after my death, please try your best to achieve Kosovo. He said it would be accomplished. And what's more, we must never allow its flow to cease. Such conviction, isn't it? Amazing. So, just as there are so many people yearning in their hearts, you also yearned in your hearts. Each one of us did. We yearned in our hearts. Because we yearned in our hearts, we had a seeking mind. And because we had that combination of a yearning heart and a seeking mind, we found the Gohonzon. So our task now, and particularly as leaders, our task with the members too, is to really unitedly yearn to find those people who are yearning. Driven on by the pain and the suffering that we see around us. So you can see from this, talking about the time, talking about this particular point in time, in September 1985, that all we're aiming for at this particular point in time, too, is very much in rhythm, isn't it? Somehow, because we all practice to the Gohonzon, we are working towards achieving no less than 3,000 members at the end of the fourth wave. We're studying the Rishalam Kokoron. We're making a contribution to the new Hall, the Ikeda Hall at Trent. A way, a cause which will help to change the ghastly karma of war which has beset Europe for so long. We are hoping soon to establish a great new centre for the Jojo Gohonzon of the UK. And we are getting more and more, well at least I am, a feeling in my bones that Sensei will come next year. This is all part of this amazing rhythm, isn't it, of life. So it's our understanding of this, isn't it, that gives us confidence and conviction. At least it does me. I'm sure it does you too. So I am convinced that next year, 1986 onwards, we'll begin to see such an expansion. And when I say expansion, I mean in the UK, when I say expansion, I don't necessarily mean vast hordes of people suddenly joining NSUK. I don't even know what to do with them if that did happen. I do see an increase in the rate of Shakabuku beyond what we've achieved so far. But I also see, in this next five-year period, a great expansion in our influence on society. And a great expansion in the influence of our daimoku upon what is happening in this country. That for sure. So this is extremely important too, isn't it? As we push out into society, for a growing understanding and acceptance, even for those who don't know what we're up to, that we're actually a body of people who are really following a cause which is 
great and pure and that we carry with us great hope and determination for the future. So this, I'm sure, will spread amongst people in this country, this understanding in these coming years. And of course, we've got to make sure as best we can that it does so. Meanwhile, as I said, the situation in this country may be getting worse. Almost surely it will be. But that emphasizes that it's the time. So as I said, in that sentence, I am not the only one pained by them. The whole populace is weighed down with sorrow. Nishin Daishonin is crediting Hoja Tokiori with some feeling of compassion and mercy. But I think that the important thing for us when we read that is, do we feel the same? Isn't it? And I count myself in this as well as you all. Do we feel the same? Are we truly pained by the suffering that we see around us? So this is a crucial point. I really feel this is something, uh, especially as responsible leaders, that we really have to face in our own lives. Are we doing all this just for numbers, quantities, just for the satisfaction of a job well done? Or are we doing it because we really feel the pain of those who are suffering around us? If we're not, then we have to challenge this in front of the bonds. Now, that I'm sure, because if we are not able to feel the pain from the suffering of those around us, then how on earth can we ever encourage and help those for whom we are responsible to feel that pain and suffering? Or worse still, those for whom we are responsible may be feeling the pain and suffering, and yet we are not. So inevitably, our words would become empty and meaningless, theoretical. So please don't think that in saying this, I'm thinking that none of you are trying to battle with this, or that I'm thinking that none of you are showing or feeling that pain. Of course, I know you are. But I feel this is the time now, towards the end of the year of the pioneer, when we really should face ourselves, including me. You know, are we really feeling this pain? So to feel it, we have to be aware, don't we, what's going on over our backyard fence. What is going on? you know, in the rest of the neighborhood or in the rest of the borough to which we belong. What is going on in the rest of this country? So this means keeping abreast with things. And most of all, it means, doesn't it, embracing not just the members in our Daimaku. This is particularly applicable to those who are you as leaders. We have to embrace everybody, not just the members. The members are easy. They've all got the garden. What about the people in your neighborhood, or your borough, or your village, or the rest of your town or city? What about the rest of the people in this country who haven't got it? So when we chant Daimoku, for our borough, or our neighborhood, or whatever. You know, it really is everyone in it. When we chant that Daimoku, we should see in it the old porter at the station, or the bus conductor on the bus we take every day. That's the way we can bring it down to earth, isn't it? Into our itching 
the people we buy our cigarettes from or our newspaper from, the barman in the local pub, we are responsible for them. Absolutely we are responsible for every single one of them. This is the reality of our task. And it's through feeling responsible for them that our H&M and our Daimoku will respond to their yearning and therefore we'll meet and we do shakabuku. So of course I'm not only directing my remarks to you, but through you I'm directing what I'm saying, learned from this incredible work called the Risho Ankoharan, to every member of NSUK. I want you to spread that understanding to everybody. This is the point, isn't it? So you know as well as I do, one can go to so many different districts with so many different characters. Most of our districts are very outward going now. They really are. And I'm sure the groups are the same, why I don't get much chance to see them. But here and there, there's that district that somehow when you go into the room, everyone's turned inwards like this. You know in a moment what the trouble is. They're not concerned with anything that's going on around them. Maybe the one or two there who are, but the others are just absorbed with themselves, with their problem, isn't it? So they'll never be happy. They will live in hell this way. Therefore, our responsibility is to struggle and sweat and chant Daimoku to help them to turn outwards, isn't it? And look beyond their garden fence and get on 100% with activities for Kosen Rufa. So Jihi means, just to refresh our memories, Ji means to nourish. To nourish. And He means sorrow. Right? G he. To nourish is a beautiful word actually in itself, isn't it? It means to help something to grow. Not just to grow, but to grow healthily and strongly and happily and valuably. And by doing that, to overcome sorrow and suffering. The sorrow of being weak and helpless, of being a slave to your desires, or a sorrow as a result of being at the mercy of your environment. Hmm? This is what that short word jihi means. And of course, as you know, jihi doesn't involve sacrifice. It doesn't mean putting jihi into action that through giving to others we become exhausted ourselves. Not in this practice. It may do in Christianity and other religions, but not in Nichiren Daishonin's Buddhism. <coughs> Neither does it mean lowering yourself into the pit of hell in order to relate to them. But instead, it means nourishing their lives, doesn't it, through giving them the gonsen or bringing them to the gonsen and seeing them become happy. The tree that you've nourished, of course, is the greatest joy that one can possibly have. And in the process, we discover also, just as Nietzsche and Vashonin said, that we're changing our unhappy karma. So there is no sacrifice in Jihi. And Jihi, as you quite understand, I'm sure, but nevertheless it's worth repeating again, Jihi is not love. Love and Jihi are totally different things. Love is an emotion. 
It can be all sorts of different things. Love can be sentimental, romantic, sexual, fatherly, motherly, all sorts of different things. And because it, it's an emotion, it's often not lasting. Sometimes it's high, sometimes it's low, sometimes it's difficult to see at all. And also because it's an emotion, it's illusory, that is to say, uh, it can magnify things to being bigger than they really are, or make big things smaller than they really are. So really, I think love, as I've often said, is it is like the surface of the sea, sometimes with huge waves, sometimes with little tiny ripples, and sometimes absolutely stagnant. And of course the other side of the coin of love being an emotion is hate, isn't it? It's very easy for love to switch to hate in a moment. Whereas jihi, true Buddhist compassion, giving nourishment which will overcome sorrow and suffering, that is like the deep current at the bottom of the ocean. Once we discover how to break our lives open and release jihi, that jihi will flow to everybody, almost whether we like it or not. But we have to break it open. So jihi has no boundaries, no categories, isn't involved in exclusivity, it's not flattering, it's not appeasing. Sometimes it's really tough when it needs to be to get a lesson home. Sometimes it's very gentle. But always it's aiming to nourish, isn't it? That's the point. It seeks, gee, he seeks to give permanent happiness. Not overnight happiness, not one-off happiness, but permanent happiness. And it supplies, once broken open or flowing, are absolutely inexhaustible. So, jihi is not the product of the bodhisattva state. The bodhisattva state is one of the nine worlds and has its negative side too. Jihi is solely the product of the state of Buddhahood. But of course it reveals itself in action through the state of Bodhisattva. <coughs> so in the Gosho to Hachiman, Nichiren Daishonin said, sufferings, Nichiren's sufferings, are the sufferings of the entire nation. Nichiren's sufferings are the sufferings of the entire nation. So this is the point, isn't it, coming back to the beginning of where I started to talk on this particular subject. You know, are we, are the sufferings of others our sufferings? <coughs> Can we feel the sufferings of the unemployed people in our town or city? Will we feel it? really relate to what they must feel like. Can we feel the sufferings of people in Mexico City probably more easily than the sufferings of the unemployed in our particular city? Because of the graphic portrayal of it in the press and on the television, on the radio. And by the way, I'm happy to tell you that in the Seiko Shimbun uh, it said that so far, so far as members in Mexico City are concerned, all are safe and no one has suffered serious injury. What they don't know about yet is the members who lived outside Mexico City uh, in the earthquake zones beyond the city itself.